Good evening. Now, the <coughs> title of this evening's talk is A Future's Inventory, or Inventory, for those of you who are spelling correctly, <laughs> for the cautious, committed, crafty, and creative. And the superintendent in your walk. Where's he gone? Oh, there you are because he liked the future. Um, and therefore, even Old Moores offers less. Now, those who don't know Old Moores, anyone doesn't know Old Moores? Anyone? You all know Old Moores? <laughs> <laughs> now you will find in there, in July 1977, one of the leaders of the Indian subcontinent was to be replaced. Not bad going, still got three weeks to go. So Old Moors is quite, not a bad book. It only goes 12 months ahead, but it's not bad. <laughs> now, as with Artnet, let's go three years back. Okay, Gap? <laughs> British Prime Minister Edward Heath resigns, Labour Party leader Harold Wilson succeeds him. A bloodless coup led by the military disposes Portuguese dictatorship and begins democratic reforms. The exterior of the Frank House by Peter Eisenman is, set in, is a set of intersecting planes. The house is a small object that sits delicately in its country site. This house will not win any most functional house of the year award said Dick Frank about the frame structure recently completed for him and his wife Susan near Cornwall, Connecticut. <laughs> Samuel Goldwyn, pioneer, Hollywood producer, died. So did Lou Kahn. So did Agnes Moorhead. The living area contains a couch and a rug, but little else in the way of conventional furniture, <coughs> as opposed to unconventional in the group three. <laughs> in the dining area, a column comes down into the floor, just beside the eating table, a reminder of the structure. <laughs> <laughs> Text writ up country and western singer died. So did Duke Ellington. So did Mama Cass. In the kitchen beyond the dining area, visual considerations dictated a sink of awkward height. <laughs> a USSR space probe lands on Mars and detects more water vapor than scientists previously supposed existed. Many details of the Frank House resemble abstract painting, although the architect's intent was only to create a house that would reflect a rigorous geometric order. Here, the underside of a false staircase, which is painted a bright green, <laughs> so he should, that colour. Ah, oh, hell. Ah, oh, hell. You're all right, Kermit. Yes. A bright green intersects with a beam that is part of the house's structure, as opposed to the false staircase. Charles A. Lindbergh, aviation pioneer, dies, so does Sir James Chadwick, discoverer of the neutron. The Frank House is divided into loosely separated functional areas, as these floors panels indicate. Semantically, that, of course, is impossible. <laughs> Patricia Hurst, kidnapped heiress, announces that she'd need a flash. Announce, or is it your teeth? announces that she has decided to join her captors, the Symbionese Liberation Army. Has Bob Maxwell arrived? <laughs> he does tend to find some of my political references irrelevant. <laughs> Streaking becomes a fad in the US. Three years ago, start of aren't it? Start of what? Mm. Yeah, thought you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rossi, an Italian architect of international prominence, is represented by several schemes, most notably a project for student housing that is a witty and wonderful composition of tiny house-like forms. 
<laughs> oh, that man's got something. Yes, he, he's no mean slouch at realising. A witty and wonderful composite, a tiny house-like form set in rows, like houses. <laughs> From a, from a Monopoly board. <laughs> With a huge reproduction of that form set in the centre of the dining hall. A mundane shape is here turned almost to magic. Again, impossible. Almost to magic. Um, almost to magic, and by an architect's skilled hand given true monumentality. Watergate and impeachment, <coughs> Gerald Ford becomes the 39th US president. Almost mon monumentality. <laughs> Adding to an old building that is not a single unit out of a complex that grew gradually over the years is a tough problem. <laughs> yes, like building London. Building a tall tower in the middle of a block of much lower structures is at least as difficult and creating apartments of better than average layouts. <laughs> well, we all try to do that. Millbank and the rest, don't we? we? all try that. Creating apartments of better than average layout, given the constraints of New York City economics, often seems nearly impossible. Again, impossible. All of these problems face Cesar Perry, architect of the Perez condominium town, gallery expansion to the Museum of Modern Art, and Mr. Perry's design, which is now making the rounds of community groups <laughs> for approval, does remarkably well at addressing this three-point challenge. Mr. Perry is aware of the quality of the original museum building. His decision to echo its window pattern in the new section is a sensitive Moreover, he intends not only to save the famous roof canopy with its Swiss cheese-like holes, but to use its design as a basis for a new canopy to run across the entire museum front of ground level. Martin Ryle, English, and Anthony Hewish, English, awarded Nobel Prize for Physics in their work on radio astronomy. Sacramento, there is very little to relieve the monotony of the environment of this dull capital city and its suburban outskirts could be anywhere in the United States. That store is the showroom for Best Products Company, a major catalog showroom merchandise. The one side of the building looks like a plain brick box, but the other side is chopped out as dramatically as if a giant had taken a bite out of it. The bottom corner, a 14-foot high right-angled piece, has been slit away from the building and it is through the space left where the corner should have been that the shoppers enter and leave the building. <laughs> the corner is not gone, however. It is still there, down a track, 42 feet away, where it sits like a monument. Now, you remember the definition of monument a bit early on, I hope. Or near monument. Where it sits like a monument. Every so often, the corner slides back along its track, and its raw edges fit precisely into the brickwork of the building to make the showroom a closed box. <laughs> The net profits of 30 of the world's largest oil companies increased by an average of 93% during the first half of 1974. In Houston, Best Products says, the unusual design resulted in the highest sales ever recorded for a catalog showroom. <laughs> the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, largest private employer in the US, bans discrimination against homosexuals. Now, off we go. That's my card. I think the, <coughs> this, is, this is Futures tonight, particularly if there's any more brandy. This is Futures tonight. And um, I think, well, you can see them. I think the last three years, they haven't been all that gloomy, but they have been rather Snoopy-like. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and the thing, about, the thing about Snoopy is that he is actually a slightly conceited dreamer. Um, and he has an art collection and a billiard room that none of us has ever seen. <laughs> and, and that secretary. <laughs> and, his, and, and his thoughts about flying. Now, I think he's slowing down, I'm pleased to say, and I think we are moving into the Kermit era. 
Now, Kermit's smashing. So was Snoopy in his time, but he was a dreamer and he was conceited and he never let us in on what was going on. We knew there was a bit of tail because he asked friends there. Um, or at least his secretary did. And uh, then they could go and look at the art collection. Whereas Kermit is very open, um, terrific enthusiast, even in the heat, and he really makes the best of a mixed bunch in full view. And that's, you know, think of Fozzie Bay. Oh, and, but he does, and he does very well, and I think uh, we will also. So let me tell you uh, three tiny bits of what I think are lovely, are indicative of good news, of things that are happening. Tiny little things, most of which you probably, or many of you know about, um, because you know the people. But one is, is, is Per Carpet's work uh, in relation to a school, Norwegian architect. He has eventually got the job of doing this school, secondary school, it has roughly the same standards as uh, a comprehensive school, as far as, uh, uh, you know, equivalent lessons and equipment taught, like science and things. So there are lots of sort of nasty, smelly gases and dangerous things that go zoomk and things like that. And it's entirely built out of huts that a timber company have always made. Not through poverty, not, they're not poverty-stricken, Norwegian, just through time. They want it quickly, he decided he'd use that, and even the linking passages, which can't put one hut against another because of the grid, therefore you've already got your little fire break and things. Don't mind the details. It's rather nice that this has been accepted in a rich economy where um, they could have had anything. And they're using huts that they've always had around anyhow because of one clever little dick, one clever little architect who's decided it will work and spent time to show them it will. And the nicest bit of news, nice meaning accurate as well as jolly, is that while he was designing this, the manufacturers of the huts told some of their previous clients about it was being used for school, and three firms of light engineering manufacturers had come along and said, we always want to build in a school, because that's the ideal thing, because that's how we see training and separating things. Could you do three factories for us, exactly the same plan as the school? Now, in this country, it wouldn't be allowed. Bits of education, then I think, you know, it wouldn't be on the DOE list or anything like that. Uh, this, so there are three buildings out of the same product through one architect being sufficiently intelligent to, rather like Kermit, to make the best of a bad job. Not a bad job, but, you know, poor stuff he got around. That was one nice thing. The other nice thing is Bill Kennedy was over recently, an architect from Houston. Uh, the, the jolly thing there wasn't so much the quality of his designs. And he has in the last, um, I forget what it is, but in the last something like five years built 700 houses and things like that. And they're all lovely, all in timber. But the nice thing was that he did a calculation. And in Houston, which is sort of rich end of the belt, where mortgage rates are high, actually, and building costs are high, the average, average house for the people who can afford houses. Therefore, it, it would be above average in what we're talking about in this country, but not much above. It's $50,000. Most people can't afford a $50,000 mortgage. So he thought, well, I take the mortgage, I'll work out how much on the average salary the average person could afford in square feet rather than in money. And he worked it out, and it came to 720 square feet which is the exact size of the average mobile home, 60 feet by 12. Now that's an interesting calculation to arrive back at. And the other one which I liked was that a pound of very, very good steak in Houston costs exactly the same as a square foot of a house. <laughs> um, now the, the um, I think the third one wasn't actually good news, it was just, it was, it was, Future's warning. Oh, yes, it was good news. I think if you um, look through various involvements that this country has in relation to government and government agencies and, and, uh, and the built environment, the, the uh, uh, tyranny of mental poverty that has been pushed out for the last 10 years by the National Building Agency and the DOE and branches of the GLC, I regret, um, is at an end. It has been 
It has been degraded, it has been shown up for being, being evil and nonsense. Never mind the generic house bands. Just think of the other thing about there are only 16 ideal shapes, for, uh, positions for staircases in the rectangular house. And then there's a little footnote saying, this is, to, this is assuming that all rooms must always be rectangular. In a very small time. And that's what you've been getting your grants on or not getting them on. And I think that's going. So that's lovely. That's, it's jolly tonight. Jolly future. Even if it sounds boring. How are you doing, Gov? He's very patient. He doesn't have to be patient much longer. <laughs> right, now. One or two other points which are, are central to the slide. Unusual exhibit at the Royal Academy. No, Royal Society. An unusual scientific exhibit at the Royal Society in London last night presented what was described as the oldest sperm in the world <laughs> in a demonstration labelled Bull Semen Frozen in 1952 and Thawed to Celebrate the Silver Jubilee. <laughs> If I can, if I can uh, make an architectural equivalent for this, there is, <coughs> there's a fellow, um, nasty man, a uh, man called Bristow, multimillionaire. Uh, that doesn't necessarily make him nasty, though it makes him questionable. Um, uh, who runs little uh, helicopters, North Sea things, North Sea oil rigs. And there's been a strike recently, which he's been a bit nasty about. However, his Victorian mansion, which is grade two in, in uh, Hampshire, the local authority are undertaking repairs, though he has applied for its demolition and wants to build a four bedroom house there. They're undertaking repairs of that house against his will and are sending him the bill. Now, if you think of the bull semen and the silver jubilee, there's a certain amount of business about time distortion as who distorts what, why, and for whom, right? Bungalows attacked by crows. A squadron of crows has started a determined attack for no known reason on three bungalows near Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> Undeterred by barriers, paper streamers and shotguns, the birds attacked the bungalows at 4 a.m. on Tuesday and had screeched and clawed at the windows ever since. Ah, your windows. Crow-proof. <laughs> When one family defended their home in Fowler's Lane, Light Oak, near Stoke, the crows bypassed the barricade of a children's slide, <laughs> streamers, and daubs of window cleaner, and concentrated on the neighbouring bungalows. We shot one, said Mrs. Jessie Morris, who'd lived in the lane for 31 years, but another took its place. <laughs> they hang upside down and looking at the windows at all times. The police passed the matter to the City Council's pest control department. Unfortunately, this is not something we normally tackle, said a police spokesman. <laughs> Clive draws up a dream future for the British worker. <laughs> dream blueprint, working life, 1980s, drawn up by Britain's biggest white-collar union, ASTMS. <laughs> Clive Jenkins, General Secretary, said yesterday, uh, with the help of North Sea Oil, riches, Britain should provide the workforce with not a bad idea. No retirement age limits, either high or low. <laughs> a four-day week for everybody, or a three-day weekend, <laughs> <laughs> or a three-day weekend. <laughs> ah, you see, that's South Wales for you. <laughs> or three. Five weeks holiday a year, and a three-month extra holiday with pay twice during the worker's lifetime. Now, that's still only half a sabbatical. Right. The plan will be introduced to motion to TUC Conference Blackpool this September. <coughs> God, I can feel the architectural vibes. <laughs> Technovit. A rapid curing acrylic supplied in powder or liquid combination can be used in the treatment of defective hooves or to build up one claw of a cow's foot by affixing a wooden block. It does not prevent regrowth of healthy, healthy tissue. Now there'll be a picture of that later on, that one. And the last one, which I think brings us absolutely straight into the slides, 
is um, this business of the of the uh, lack of need that any of us has to be particularly accurate in being useful in the future. But councils are warned not to waste money on patching up decaying properties which may fall down after a few years. The ministry said homes should only be renovated if a minimum life of five to ten years can be assured. Well, it's five to ten, it can be fifty to a hundred, two to four, one to two, one hundred to two hundred. So I think with that sort of accuracy being asked of us, we don't have to be too sensitive about things falling down or indeed lasting longer than we'd like them to. <laughs> now, as we've only got seven years left till 1984, I thought I'd do seven futures. Is there any more brandy or if I got to sort of keep this one going? <laughs> Absolute silence, obviously, keep this one going. Now, I think I'd probably read my things without this scorcher on. Yeah, I think probably with the light on. Oh, oh, yeah. Change the light. to the building than a straight one and is appropriate to the apex of the field as is the concave form of the entrance front. Lots of, ah, lots of people still do that on airport design, we saw some today. <laughs> there is expressive lightness and grace about this handling of a problem still new to architecture in Britain. Well that was Plato Bilbury in the early 30s and that's the painting that's on show at the moment. And that was the other day over London. <laughs> and that is one of our key future jobs. Squeezing airports, docks, houses, and high security truck parks together in almost unbearable physical proximity and seeing what happens uh, for a comparatively short time. Can't give you working drawings because they're, they're in metric and you might not understand. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. <yeah. coughs> There's something about the size of things which have more um, importance, I think will have more importance in the future through them being only recognized for a short time than they've had in the past through being accepted for a long time. Um, these people, when this rig went, so I actually asked them in the street. When this rig went, I said, I, I bet you're glad that thing's gone. And they've said, oh no, no, it was, it was like a forest, they said, but we've heard there's another one being ordered. <laughs> um, this thing, of course, is never seen except by one loony photographer because it, it's, <coughs> it's sunk in the water and won't be seen till someone someday has to decide how to get rid of it. So I think that the whole point, like the aircraft, the airport, the Lancaster's over thing, or indeed those planes the other weekend, you know, halfway up the post, you know, just over the top of the post office tower, has something to do with, for those of you who were kind enough to be here last time, uh, scale, interval, and time and frequency, which I think is where, in fact, we, as architects, can be useful in the future as opposed to any other particular discipline. And we can be useful in a way that delights people in, in distortion of scale, interval, time, and frequency, if we work at it. And nothing else to work at, have we? And what the hell's, oh, that's a gap, natural gap. Three slides, that's right, three slides. Did we have three? Yeah. We did, good. Four next lot. Um, now the next one is um, another, these are all happy things in the future. Ah, oh, 
disappointing me. Poor old thing, he'd been, <laughs> be in a hospital or something if I was 60. Good luck. <laughs> the cooler it is here tonight. Right, off we go. Now look at that. Grey Wernham, old one eye. Um, design of the RIBA. Smashing building, still there. Leave, leave Victoria by train. You'll see it on your left hand side. Utilitarian function of a riverside dock for like, collecting and shipping municipal muck has been treated by the architect so as to produce a clean and simple and at the same time interesting building. Thus on the left is seen part of a semicircular ramp up which the collecting vans have access to their garages and workshops. The refuse barges entering through the portcullis doorway seen on the right are loaded under cover with dust extraction plant above. And in fact that, that portcullis thing still works. I've got two cigars in the um, still works, you know, it goes up and down and sucks all the dust out while the other barge is waiting on the other side. Depot was one of the first of its kind to be regarded as an architectural problem for which credit is due to the initiative of the council. <laughs> when I said, first, first program I ever set at the AA when I taught there in 1958 was for a supermarket and the then principal called me in because Unit masters then could set equivalent programs. You didn't have to check with the year master. And he called me and he said, I'm sorry, it's no use. A supermarket isn't architecture. 1958. Hey. Now what's that? By God, look at that. <laughs> Why have you cut out what was written underneath? So? The words. Oh, because I, I'm putting mine in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> As you can see, they were slightly, they were angled against they were angled. it. Yes, yes. Yes, that's very good. Now, the whole point about that... <laughs> the whole point about that, that is ad hocery gone mad. You must admit. And um, the little... I've done, because I'm so pleased, there's so many cabins there, and I marked them red because they work as, as thingies, and, and a thingy sound thing, stopping the train noise getting in, you see. Yes, must be that reason I put it up, mustn't it? I'm getting bored of this already. I don't know how you must be. Oh, yes. Now, here we are, putting bits together. This can't be the right section. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it's not bad, really. If I can. <laughs> Assembly as process. That's what it was. That's what the last one was about before you threw me with the angle <laughs> comments. Yes. Now, assembly as process. No one can really imagine that this thing will stay like that for its length of life, although it has to go in the year 2000. Um, and indeed, this fine side of it here, these look rather good, but those went the next day, because those weren't meant to be there, because they were green. <laughs> the green ones and the brown ones stayed. <laughs> Going off that altogether. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, the same as places. Well, because they didn't have enough money halfway through, we put fairgrounds and things in there. Not that the structure provided them much, but it did give them a feeling of identity. You know, plate, urban place scale and a certain sort of well in a way of monumental containment in three-dimensional ethereal thing sort of thing. And they felt it, you know, you could see them sort of leaning up against it. A column came down to remind them of the structure. A column came down to remind them of the structure. A column came down to remind them of the structure. That's right. <laughs> you sure you wouldn't like to? Even <laughs> uh, kick the other leg off. You, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh God, you're all ganging up. <laughs> mm. Well, I see. Well, there they are. Yes. Well, they, they might have different ones later on. Those are some before they went in. <laughs> what an awful last night. <laughs> oh, there they are going in. It's very easy to put them in. Yes. Right, that's the end of that section. Now, Futures 3. Go off that. Assembly as process, that was about. Very key to the future. Poorly chosen slides, but very key. <laughs> Not all this argument about, you know, product versus process. That's, that's, that's a load of cobblers brought in largely by the, by the systems men. But, but, but uh, assembly and reassembly as a continuous process is a, is a design problem. It's something that we should be very good at. No one else is. Mm -hmm. 
And this is futures. We got three years or seven. Elemental delight. This is an excitement. This I like this. Ah oh, yes, elemental delight. Prefabricated mats of reinforcements, heating pipes, and conduit being hoisted by tower train from multi-use story of flats, etc., at uh, somewhere near somewhere in France. <laughs> The boot, pillar, and pound contiguous cavity house. Now these are all a long, long time ago, these things. Nothing new. However, they are something which, for one reason or another, the architectural profession has neglected of recent times. If you can see how some of the uh, most elaborate, sort of uh, apparently mechanized and technologically advanced buildings have been put up, the processes in which they've been put up have been extremely ordinary. And an ordinary process in the construction industry is a killer. And the construction industry is second only to the mining industry for the greatest number of deaths. Sorry to be gloomy. But fortunately, because of the recent um, Health and Safety Works Act, architects are now criminally responsible for designing something that causes injury or death to a builder in putting it up. And we are criminally responsible for that. If we design something that really is too hard to design, someone to put out and they get killed, we can be sued. I and a few other right-minded people are trying to extend that for the demolition of the same building that we design. If we design something that is so dangerous to pull down that it kills someone, we are criminally responsible. Now, the nice thing about that isn't that there are some villains in Whitehall trying to catch us out. There's someone somewhere saying, Look, we'll make you safe angels. You know, here's the stick, you show us the carrot. <laughs> Not the other way around. And that's marvellous. You know, we're, we're having it on a plate. All of a sudden, people are starting realising that, goodness knows, we might actually be involved with something serious, like life and death rather than Mrs. Kurtz deciding it was impossible to avoid monumentality. <coughs> she should have breathed out. Now, oh, well, now this is, this is, this is, this is going to take some time, gang. I had to get permission from the governor to share these. <laughs> well, what this is about is in the, in the same section, actually, and it is elemental de delight. And I think that we have a, a fine opportunity, though it hasn't been seized all that much, of, of looking again at the sort of, literally, of, the sort of elements we use. Architects. Just sort of things like beams or post-tension things or air bubble or whatever it is. And seeing how, in fact, when we, when we have them without a job, back to Bucky's anticipatory design. If we keep up our alphabet of what we know we can handle, rather like Ron's brilliant sort of library of, of being able to build trusses that can carry all sorts of extraordinary things, you know, I mean, he knows the library. Then, in fact, uh, any, anything that might need a truss or a beam at a later stage, and it could just be the cab of a car, I haven't put it on these slides, also has the other inherent delights in that element if we explore them before we have a job, so to speak. And we did this to a large extent, and I, I'll be contradicted, that, that's the uh, Trondheim section, done by Tony Dugdale, Archie Graham, Pierre Cartvet, uh, uh, and myself. Anyone else? That was it, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and the colours, really, are just distinguishing the particular things that any particular element at the time does. But all of them, all of them, are, are elements that, over and above their real presence, have a capacity to achieve something else. Even if it's only a swinging grand piano, stops people walking under it, because it's just too bloody frightening <laughs> to stand under it when it's swinging at the end of a crane. So you don't have to put cords out. You swing a, a, a grand piano in a crowd of people. They'll move. You don't have to say, don't, you know, please keep back. They all have quality, as long as we, as long as we appreciate the element of time and immediacy, which if we were fully paid up members of the human race and not architects, we would appreciate. I mean, we wouldn't stand under a grand piano swinging around at the end of a crane. Well, we don't. 
And that's just taking the same color code further on some other ones, some other illustrations that previously appear. Ah. It's terrible, I think. I don't know if it's like. Ah, think long, quickly. <laughs> Tis futures. Think long, quickly. This, um, there are one or two, and you can't, well, you can, if I only use one. There are one or two big chalk pits in Essex. Now, there are lots of funny things all elsewhere over the country. I mean, you discovered a lot on your, your trip, in the earlier lecture. There are lots of rum spaces that, that people find as adverse, and, uh, unless they think of something else, you know, because they don't think of something else to do with them. Again, architects are well suited. You know, once the disease for drawing elaborate isometric drawings of buildings that only a bird could see, or balsa wood model, you know, once one starts getting a bit sort of tight and mean with one's time, then you find, as I did, a, a, a pit in Essex, that size, which is ideal for some tests I'm doing in Manhattan. Um, because I, I, I got permission for free, it's 80 feet deep, it's 2,000 feet square, it's absolutely white, and I'm putting pegs and things, and I've got a, a, a labor force of 20 men, paid for, what's it, um, uh, job encouragement soon. It's this thing to make us pretend that we haven't got, you know, two million unemployed. See. Um, and uh, we're setting up a whole lot of, of things which one couldn't really do either with models or with a computer because you'd never, you'd never be able to put in the different climatic changes. And it's just what you can see at, with, a, with a neutral background at 2,000 feet, etc., etc. So, but uh, it'll only be available for six months and then gone. But it isn't costing anybody anything t for me to use it. Just as, as this has actually been used. This is at the bottom of his sister's garden in Shetland. Now, the bottom of the garden isn't normally like that. <laughs> but they, they, it, it came in because of a storm. <laughs> the local authority now are interested uh, about the effect that these sort of structures might have when they're up against other structures, as are the oil people. So they're doing their sort of wind tests on these things because they're there. They're only there for a fortnight. They'll have gone by the time you see that, by the time we, that's on the screen. Um, that's an oldie, but I, I still think that the, uh, it's important, even if you, uh, which we can do, which the, the resources are available. It's the, most of the resources that are available to the architectural profession now are at the cheap end of the scale in comparison with, with conventional architectural elements, not at the expensive end. The only thing that's expensive is nerve. That seems to have drained out of the architectural profession at the moment, but that's no concern of mine because it makes the competition less. Um, <laughs> But the, the, even if you have things such as, as uh, roads and drains and things that only last for 20 years, which are quite, in fact, indeed, very economic, where you know, water tables are high and electricity supply is intermittent, etc., etc., you can still actually make a good economic excuse, not necessarily for wrecking houses, but for changing them into something else, because the roads are still there, even though the roads are only there 20 years. Equally with this, which I'm sorry about this slide, because it should just be those top two. Uh, a thing which Will Orsop was, was absolutely central to was this development in the centre of Glasgow, where in fact, uh, which I see someone has sort of said, oh, well, why don't we just have green fields in the middle of London, because we'll never get the people back. Quite right. I think we went a bit further and said, well, in the middle of Glasgow, why don't we grow cheap food? That's a marvelous thing for a civic centre. Then they might be able to afford theatres on the outskirts, or opera houses, or even town halls. Um, so that was, that was a food growth thing in centre of Glasgow. And then the other thing was doing something with a breakwater that had to be uh, somewhere, what you add to breakwaters. So doing something um, uh, for, for a short term in time is, is terrific potential future for us, I think. He said, smiling, as, as the audience, the eyes were dropping, chins were getting flobby. It is late and hot, and we've been here a long time. But I am enjoying. So think long, quickly. I think that's, wait a minute, hold on. Should be a gap. No, hey. Ah, yes. 
So these are the, just the same, you see, the, the, this, this uh, man who designed the truck, designed the house, they never had to speak to each other. They didn't even know that that, that situation, that situation interface was going to occur. Um, but it did, and it was because they were both sufficiently slack and loose and capable of, of such handling and such capacity uh, that such a movement could take place, as in, as in uh, Brazil recently, that building was moved there. Now, the, the nice thing about that is it wasn't designed to move there, except that they had something better to do with that space. But because it moved so easily, the, uh, the city region, that, that city area is thinking, Christ, we can always double up on the usefulness of our sites, because we can say, well, we've got a cathedral or an office block there, but we know we can move it. Not pull it down, move it. So when you design something on a place, if you, just with a little bit of extra care, perhaps you could design three or four other uses for that site at the same time. So if we don't, no one else will. <coughs> modesty, the next one. Ah, uh, modesty, yes. Oh, this is just showing how, how even the most superb building just blend into the thing. <laughs> <laughs> just blend in. Just blend in. So I can't afford Gordon Cullen now he's got his gong. <laughs> <laughs> I told you to be quick. Now, I do think that uh, we move on now, quite seriously, to a nasty thing, purely because I was criticised by someone who I wish was here tonight, but isn't. And I was surprised by this criticism, as they said, uh, doesn't matter who it was, but someone I admire, they said, I think you're a hypocrite, and it was because of that reference I made that, uh, whereas, uh, Economists, soldiers, farmers, and politicians had always put forward sort of solutions, however unsuccessful, to Northern Ireland. Architects never had. I mean, it might have been just as unsuccessful, but it is a, it's a problem, and they never had. And I mentioned that, and he said he thought I was a hypocrite. So I'm putting this on, not as a sneer, but just as a, as a little warning. This isn't one of the seven-year jollies. This is just a little nasty, because they both appeared uh, the same year, 1938, and they were published in this country in a book uh, by the Timber Development Association. And one says, entrance to a German sports ground, the most impressive, this most impressive gateway is formed by the use of small round logs. Well, that it is. The whole structure is light, but it has great stability and considerable decorative effect. <coughs> Well, indeed it has. <laughs> um, and this is a small timber garage in Abbott's Langley. This garage was designed for single-handed erection. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed, it looks so it might be. And um, <laughs> not nice hinges. But that's, that's, uh, that's just a warning. You know, don't think we're out of it. We're not. Never, ever, never out of it. Can't be uncommitted. Nonsense, if we think we can. Stab me. Stab. <laughs> it's memory lane. <laughs> ah, this is sophistication, yes. Time that enables change. Ah, well, I think really all, I, all I'm saying there is that if you find a really bum staircase, you can use it inside and outside. <laughs> <laughs> Time enables change. That was before Corpus drawing, by the way. Um, and that's drawing my meal, even finer structure, not giving away too much, admittedly. <laughs> but it is terribly big, very, very big. And the whole lot will come down to the ground so that it can be painted. So it doesn't have to be an aluminum or stainless steel. And then the little thing can trundle up again. And all the sort of things that can drop out of the roof uh, can make walls or barriers, or whatever, because they're all carried by the ceiling. So it doesn't have a name yet, apart from a damn fool one, which can't be traced. <laughs> That's another one. Another sophistication. Back to the business about people dying. There was a marvellous advert, some, uh, oh, two years ago, and it was some firm selling uh, packet, you know, uh, portagames or something for a building site. 
And it said, just when your client sees this, he'll say, um, how lovely, or something like that. And I, which wasn't a very good advert, but it was a good photo. So I changed it and said, the client will say, stop here, I don't want the real thing. That, that is, but it's likely that in, in, in construction and design and producing the, the sort of safety, the degree of technical um, servicing, the capacity for, for major changes, that you need to run a good building site properly, added to the delight uh, you know, and, and protection and well-being, etc., etc., of, of the building workers, you're getting very near in some way, to what that site should be used for anyhow. Because if you're always pulling the thing down and putting it up, it would be a site of continuous employment. So you wouldn't need to find people to go in the offices. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not quite as daft as it sounds. And what it is important is that if you take something like the, the nature of finance of a building, from the little sparkle in a man's eye having spent 15 years raising the money, whether he be a minister or a private millionaire, it doesn't matter, to someone actually matching his money with, with a need, to, to architects, etc., and sites being found, to things being designed, to things being built, to things being occupied, to things being uh, let less successfully, to things being pulled down, to the site staying vacant again. The time that the building is actually up, being used for what it's meant to be used for, unless you take my last point but one, which is the business of, of continuous process, which you never design completely. And I, I'm not talking about indeterminate design with, with loony bay wind, <laughs> wind bay intervals. No, it's not, not quite that. Um, then it might be uh, a very useful future particularly with a large unemployment building industry, not to build schools in Yorkshire for people to learn how to lay tarmac roads, but continuously to have building sites um, starting construction and then stopping it <laughs> throughout London. And, and you would improve canteens, safety, safety clothing, clinics, access to bankers, you know, for, for the builders, control of labor force for the unions, methods of trucking in, trucking out for the handling equipment, a whole magic on every site that no one else had thought anything else to do with but let the weeds grow on. Well, it's a thought. I mean, it's something I'm working on, but it's a thought. There it is. There you are, Jane. <laughs> Oh, you see, we haven't got. I had, I had a fortnight in the office. True or not true? Think glue. Do you remember? Yeah. And the glue expert there. He yeah. cans of it. We were sticking everything to everything. See, how we were better than the deck of a VC10 when we finished. <laughs> we know everything about glue. Think glue. Uh, and there, there is, is that side, side of me, which I think should be a useful side of all of us. Is just have a little bit of think. Not about, not about converting, oh, unwanted churches into community halls or houses for, for expensive potters in Cornwall or anything like that, but um, now and again some of, the, some of the dross of what is used to make other things, like floats for oil rigs. You know, this thing actually is up for bids. It's lying on its side on the sand in Scotland. And it is roughly about the size of a very useful medium-sized fish farm. Um, so I'll take that off the screen very quickly. <laughs> right. All right, Pete. Because it is, it is the end of a smashing, wonderful three years. Well, it's the beginning of many more marvelous years. The end of one sweaty bun. Why you always have it in the summer? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy doubt and misunderstanding. <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> Something buzzing. Oh, it's, it's snooping. Now, I, I, I think that is one of the most smashing shops ever built. That's that thing by Messel. 
Uh, that, I think, is one of the most smashing churches ever built, and one of the nastiest memorials ever built. Um, but the nice thing is that when they built that for the Duke of Wellington in St. Paul's, they thought it would look big. In fact, it looks absurdly small. Uh, when they put her there, they thought she would make this area friendly because they thought the building looked big. But in fact, she looks ridiculous in another way because she doesn't match any. So it's a touch, it's a touch of things. I mean, these are filing boxes. I mean, this was, it wasn't the end of the, you know, it wasn't the end of the era of the shop. They were always there <laughs> in notices. And the thing about these two, not so much the, although I, I must admit I do like this, it went from stone to uh, steel to stone. And these are lamps. These things. As of course, oh no, oh those are of course. But I think I think the um, which funnily enough I think is a bit depressing, um, almost as an exception to what I think is an extremely good exhibition at the A this year, which I might add is the only school of architecture exhibition I've seen yet this year. But there there is there is a very there's a fall off of awareness of, of using scale um, as a real mind blower. Uh, you know, there's big scale and small scale, and there's jokey scale and, and things like that. But there's an, And I think that in the future, rather like these slides of the, the oil rig behind the houses, and one or two other things I've shown, which is why I brought it back, and the, two even, not square slides, I think they're lovely slides, but two similar slides, I think, here, that's right. Um, I think there is something uh, that has an element of uh, future potential, even in things that are built which may well be, um, you know, at the end of the line, maybe mammoths, maybe, maybe something like the Sears, uh, Sears Roebuck block. Um, it's not going to be easy to take down, it's very unlikely that sales will want to occupy it as their headquarters for anything like as long as they plan. Um, I don't know quite what you can do with it, control balloon lifts or <laughs> parachute glides or something like that. But the fact that we've, we, oh, at Fazer Khan, not us, but have uh, built it, reminds us of the, I mean, that's glamorous because it's a smashing card. It's become like a 1930 card, you know, with the yellow edge. But it isn't all that smashing. It's a, it's a damn misery to walk past it because you get your things blown off, or your hat, you know, hair. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it isn't much fun, but um, it is something. So therefore, I think there is a certain, I, I would rather conservationists, you know, gave up bothering about Thaxted and, and Flatland Mill and all that, and started worrying about Sears Roebuck. Not to save it, but what the hell you do, you know, how you can actually humanize it. Um, because Sears Roebuck won't want it for long. There are flats for rent in Hancock, in the Hancock Tower. Now this one's a bit different. You'll see there's some very delicate cu hand colouring by myself. <laughs> uh, so and you see that line up the side of that, which I did. And the dome I whitened in. <laughs> Little whitened in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guess what I was trying to show with those, those ones. I shall explain it all. I think I used this before, but it's still a beauty, and it, it delights me because everything went wrong. Um, this was the stripe in Covent Garden, and there are just one or two things which I liked. One was painted. We wanted to have a pavement painted red because it had a tank coming in, and all the surrounds, the rusty painted surrounds, red. Well, it was red, all that, and the local thought. You can't paint the wall because it's a little building and you can't put paint on. So it's a red plastic. Oh, no problem to say that. No paint. It was just mustn't be paint. Now, so that was all right. So then we in this little barbed wire. So I said, barbed wire. 
which is far more lethal because it's stainless steel wire rusted with little red ribbons tied on. It's all right because the ribbons are not barbs, they're ribbons. Right. <laughs> so then we get here. Now these are railway sleepers and railway lines, and that's a, an actual uh, 1926 pit cage that takes six people, a real one, got from Yorkshire. That's all to make because that's the three foot high for GLC or one meter 137 or <coughs> 107, and that's the four inches gap for children's heads not to get jammed through. <laughs> We had to make them all, you see. <laughs> but we had a real cage, and we had Dennis's marvelous back projection screens, and we had the best thing that Ernest Bevan ever said. You can read it, but if anyone's interested, probably not. Um, two reviews, one review came out, and, and the high spot was the full-size replica of a pit cage. <laughs> Sweaty <laughs> blood to get that thing. <laughs> Covered with grease, the real one. We had 18 letters. Not I hired Bromley in the church, or whoever it's called, all of them. Very interesting railway game. <laughs> Could you guess where it runs? <laughs> That's the other thing about the future. You really stay sure to get it it won't hurt him. <laughs> so, you see, if you can get it right, you're the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, to really be useful in the future, look back, as long as someone has you photograph them, head, and they must be friends, Thank you.